We live so much in dependence on one another. And for a long time we've been told that we should celebrate that fact. With the idea being that somehow the system could be made that everybody benefits. But look at us now. Our interdependence has brought us illness, it's brought death to some people, it's brought a lot of fear. Because we know deep down inside that this interdependent system is unstable. To survive, we need one another for the food. Even the air we breathe, we breathe one another's air. Living beings feed off of other living beings, both emotionally and physically. There's no way we could survive as beings without this principle of interdependence. But it also means that survival is suffering. Survival as beings is suffering. And for a lot of people, the only alternative would be non-existence, being a total wipeout. But the Buddha found that there is another alternative. You can free yourself from having to be a being. You don't have to be defined. And there is a happiness that doesn't have to depend on anything. That possibility is what we practice for. But you can't use that possibility as the means. The means are our interdependent actions, the things we hold on to, the things we identify with. Think of the image of the raft. This shore, the Buddha said, stands for self-identity, the ways in which we define ourselves. The far shore is unbinding. When they get to unbinding, we have to find twigs and branches and leaves and grass on this shore, bind them together in the right way, and then put our raft in the water, the fourfold, fourfold flood, <clears throat> and make our way to the farther shore by making an effort with our hands and feet. The effort is the effort we put into the meditation, and the effort we put into virtue, concentration, discernment. We use the things we've got. We try to use them skillfully, which means that as we're practicing, we're still interdependent. We're still in an unstable position, but it's at least better than not practicing. I know a lot of people who find a lot of anguish at this time because they don't see any way out. They're trapped. They begin to realize the interdependence does trap you. If you don't know the way out, it's pretty scary. But the Buddha's good news is there is a way out. But we don't find it by celebrating the twigs and the branches and the leaves. We make use of them. We make skillful use of them. As I said the other day, the proper response to interdependence is not celebration, it's heedfulness, circumspection, realizing that we have to be skillful. And we have to be skillful all around. Because after all, the means by which we get to the other side, at some point we're going to have to abandon them. You have to be heedful even of the path. Circumspect in how you develop the path. So take this time to develop a good, strong sense of Sangwega, but at the same time a sense of Basada, that there is a way out. We can find our way to freedom. But it requires that we be skillful, and not just skillful in the meditation, skillful in our interaction with one another.
It's in times of stress and restriction like this that we should come to appreciate one another rather than be clawing at one another, realizing that we depend on one another. Look for the good in other people. This is what the principle of admirable friendship is all about. You try to find examples in other people, examples of conviction, examples of generosity, virtue. discernment, and then try to emulate them. So look around you. There are good examples around you. No one person may have all four qualities, or be fully developed in all four qualities. But look for the people who are more developed than you are. The ones who are strong in their conviction that their actions are going to make a difference. The ones who are virtuous, very careful to be harmless, generous with their time, generous with their knowledge, generous with their forgiveness. And discerning in how things come and go in the mind, which things come and have a good effect, which things come and have a bad effect. That's what it means to have discernment. The texts say, Discernment means discernment into arising and passing away. It's not simply just watching things coming and going, but it's being able to make comparisons. See, when some things come, good things come along with them. When other things come, bad things come along with them. And you begin to realize which causes you have some power over, which ones you don't. You focus on the ones that you can have some power over. And you use that discernment to look back on your conviction, virtue, and generosity. So you can be circumspect in how you practice these things. Sometimes conviction and the principle of karma get people really worried about what kind of bad karma they may have in the past. I had a lot of questions about that when I was in Brazil. How do I know that I don't have bad karma in the past? And the answer is, you have bad karma in the past, otherwise you wouldn't be a human being. But then the Buddha teaches you, you don't have to suffer from that past bad karma. You develop your ability not to be overcome by pleasure and pain. You develop your immeasurable attitudes, the sublime attitudes. You develop your virtue, your discernment. And that process of developing these things can protect you from your past bad actions, so you're not totally exposed. But at the same time, you have to accept the fact there are bad actions in the past, and they may come up in all kinds of different ways. The trick is how to learn not to suffer from their results. Bring discernment to your virtue. There's always the problem that when people follow the precepts, they think themselves better than other people, and just kind of conceit develops around that. And as Ananda pointed out, there is healthy conceit and unhealthy conceit. The healthy conceit is when you see that other people can be virtuous and harmless, they're human beings, you can do it too. Unhealthy conceit is when you just start comparing yourself to find where you're better than others. And the sermon reminds you, watch out for that. The same with generosity. Generosity can have its... its bad side as well, when you start giving in ways that are not skillful, giving in ways that harm yourself, that harm the recipient. Discernment helps you see that. So discernment is not just a matter of watching things coming and going and saying, oh, that things just come and go and there's nothing really solid there, so I might as well give up. It's seeing that there are some ways of acting that are skillful and other ways that are not skillful. And even with skillful qualities, you have to be circumspect. When you see these qualities in other people, you try to emulate them and develop them in yourself. And that's how our friendship with one another, our interdependence, actually becomes an asset on the path.